And uh, I think uh, this practice of the bell of mindfulness can be used in uh, in your office every time uh, the telephone rings. Uh, that is called telephone meditation that uh, many people uh, in Europe in, and in North America have already practiced and love it. So telephone meditation can be in uh, staying where you are and this using the ring as uh, a bell of mindfulness and um, breathing in, breathing out, quiet. Welcome to the Be Here Now guest podcast. This series features a collection of teachings and conversations centered around mindfulness, spiritual growth, and living a life in balance. Each week, our diverse network of guest teachers and hosts offer up wisdom and practices from a different spiritual path and perspective. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash donate. Welcome to to Under the Teaching Tree, a guest podcast that comes from the Ojai Foundation, a jewel of a sanctuary in the upper Ojai Valley of Southern California. I'm Jacqueline Dabrinska, the Director of Outreach and Education for Love Serve Remember Foundation, and I worked with the Ojai Foundation to help bring this series of lectures to you. So I want to give you a little bit of the rich and interesting history about how these came to be. And I'm going to do that by asking you to relax, settle, open, breathe, and imagine. Imagine you're sitting in the shade of an oak tree in the sweet California desert. Around you, between the mountain peaks of the Topa Topas, is a special valley, one that was once an inland sea and homeland still to the Chumash people. Under the shade of this oak, it's almost as if you can hear words of wisdom wafting in the wind. This is the echo of four decades of teachers who stood under an oak tree in that desert, sharing life experiences and age-old wisdom. His masters like Roshi Joan Halifax, Thich Nhat Hanh, Joanna Macy, Maladoma Somay, Joseph Campbell, Jean Houston, and many, many others, including Native American, Tibetan, Zen, and Judo Christian teachers. It also included our beloved Ramdas. You see, almost a hundred years ago, 450 acres of this valley was preserved by theophysist and Bassant, who wanted to build an eclectic community that was devoted to art and agriculture, education, and enriching cross-cultural spiritual experiences. In 1975, the Ojai Foundation, which was originally known as the Human Dimension Institute West, bit of a mouthful, they took up residency on 40 acres of Annie's preserved land. And their goal was to foster practices that awakened connection to self, circle, and the greater good. They emphasized things that were slowly reemerging at the time, things like counsel, rites of passage, land stewardship, and wisdom traditions from diverse cultures and lineages from around the world. More and more voices began to share under that tree, and it eventually became known affectionately as the teaching tree. Counsel emerged as a practice. It was one that allowed convergent and divergent points of view simultaneously. And I think it's something we're all needing to learn and embrace in this day and age. In this practice, each person learns to offer their personal story from their heart. And we each listen with our hearts and with full attention. Unfortunately, in 2017, things changed for the Ojai Foundation. The Thomas Fire, which was the largest wildfire in California at that time, it kissed the ground. And the foundation needed a new way to move ahead. They're doing that in many and various ways right now. And this podcast, Under the Teaching Tree from the Ojai Foundation, is one way that they can bring forward some of the foundation's rich history to share it with others, a larger audience, maybe one that wouldn't fit under that tree. 
It's also a way for the foundation to express its immense gratitude to those who gifted this timeless wisdom, these practices, and really this guidance for these times. But it is important to note that these talks represent an earlier era of the foundation's history and legacy. So it doesn't necessarily reflect all of the current values, mission, and vision. But still, much of what is shared is perennial wisdom, things that really speak to our hearts and our minds today. So we invite you to settle in, to listen to each of these podcasts as that council of voices, as a group of individuals rooted in shared care for the earth and in that human capacity to listen, to love, and to place oneself in service of something larger. We hope that the wisdom that's shared here will be heard by those who are seeking it and that you are nourished well by it. Today's lecture is from Thich Nhat Hanh, who came to the Ojai Foundation for at least two significant retreats. As you listen, you can imagine that you are walking with him in that slow and careful manner, listening to him with those mindful words. His gentleness helps us remember that peaceful social activism is not necessarily separate from contemplative practices. In case you don't know who he is, it is said that Thich Nhat Hanh writes with the voice of the Buddha. He was a Vietnamese Zen master, poet, best-selling author, and peace activist, and he's known as the father of mindfulness. When he was the chairman of the Vietnamese Buddhist peace delegation during the Vietnam War, he was nominated by Dr. Martin Luther King for the Nobel Peace Prize. In 1966, he visited the United States and Europe on a peace mission and was unable to return to his native land. In 1982, he founded Plum Village, a meditation community in southwestern France, where he taught and gardened and aided refugees worldwide. Earlier this year, in January of 2022, he left his body. Yet his influence on Western minds and practices and lives will ripple throughout many, many eras to come. In this episode, he's talking about using the activities in our daily lives, actually the distractions of our daily lives, as these incredible opportunities to create more mindfulness more understanding, more care, and more compassion. You know, sometimes his accent can be hard to understand. So if you are having any trouble, please visit Be Here Now Network on youtube.com so you can see the translations as you listen. And with that, let us turn our hearts, minds, and attention to the incredible wisdom transmitted from this great wisdom keeper. Uh, you know that uh, in my country, uh, each, each village has a temple, just like here, uh, a church. And there is a huge bell hanging uh, in the tower, in the bell tower. And the bell is for the whole village to practice not only for the monks and nuns. And uh, every time uh, the people hear the bell, they are supposed to practice uh, st- 
stop the talking, stop the thinking, and uh, go back to, to the breathing. It has been like that for 2,000 years, but sometimes people forget. They think that the bell is to tell us time to go and cook and do something like that. But if you uh, practice the bell of mindfulness to go back to yourself and uh, breathing, you will like it because it helps you to to be yourself, to be alive. And as uh, in the West there is no Buddhist temple, you might like to use the church bell as bell of mindfulness. Or the wind, the uh, onsa, can, uh, can be uh, a bell of mindfulness onsa. When I was in uh, Montreal four or five years ago, I gave a talk to the Canadians. And during the talk, uh, the church nearby rang the bell, and the bell lasted very long. It may be five minutes. And I stop and breathe and breath like that. And it turns out that uh, these five minutes of non-talking is the best of the talk. <laughs> Not only to me, but to uh, people who came and listened. One, one year we had uh, a retreat here in Ohio, and when we came, there was a fire all around, and uh, there were a lot of smoke and noises, because the helicopters uh, reached five or six minutes, came up uh, to the sky and produced that kind of noise it is not very pleasant. Especially for us who uh, have gone through the war, and helicopters means uh, rockets, bombs, things like that. So all of us were disturbed by the noise of the uh, helicopters. And finally, in the afternoon, I asked everyone to make use of the noise. And every time. Uh, we hear the helicopters, whether we are in a Dharma talk or in walking meditation, we will stop and uh, breathe and say, listen, listen, this wonderful sound brings me back to my full self. Uh, a number of us did not believe that we could succeed. But uh, after a few hours, we all realized that it is possible, it was possible to practice with the he uh, helicopters. So from that time on, the noise uh, did not uh, bother us anymore. And uh, I think uh, this practice of the bell of mindfulness can be used in uh, in your office every time uh, the telephone rings. Uh, that is called telephone meditation that uh, many people uh, in Europe in, and in North America have already practiced and they love it. You know, every time uh, the phone rings, it creates a sort of uh, vibration in our nervous system. Uh, we don't know who is calling and what is the matter. So in order to find out, we rush to the telephone and pick it up. Uh, we cannot resist. So telephone meditation consists in uh, staying where you are and breathe, using the ring as uh, a bell of mindfulness, and um, breathing in, breathing out quietly. Uh, we know that we can afford to do that because nobody uh, hung up 
after the first ring. If uh, they really have something important to tell us, and then they would wait at least three or four, so you can practice. Breathing in, I calm my body, breathing out, I smile. And when it rings for the second time, you can still do that. And uh, when you breathe and smile for the second time, your smile will be more solid. Try and see. Uh, and uh, when you breathe for the third time, in and out, you go slowly to the telephone and you pick it up. And uh, there, there you are with the telephone, smiling and still breathing. And this is uh, for the root of the other person. <laughs> Not only for yourself, but for the root of uh, the other person. And I'm sure that the uh, the quality of the conversation will be Im- better by that kind of practice. It's very simple, but it is very effective. If you are the one who uh, make the mix, the phone call, and then you do like this. You stick um, on the phone a gata. Uh, the original in Vietnamese has uh, only 20 words, but this is the translation roughly. Words can travel thousands of uh, miles, and they are to, to grow up more understanding and mutual acceptance. I vow that my words will be like gems. I vow that my words will be like uh, em, do, em, uh, emboi- uh, em, embroideries, yes, embroideries. And you stick it to the phone. Every time you want to make a phone call, you put your right hand on it and you breathe. You breathe two times because each line is one breath. In, out, in. Uh, it means you you give you yourself a chance to to be more of yourself, and at the same time you vow that you will practice uh, right speech, loving speech. So we need to remind ourselves, and then you take it, uh, pick it up, and you make the dial. In France. There are eight numbers. So there are people who breathe in, breathe out, <laughs> breathe in, breathe out for four, four more other times. They do it slowly. They don't have to rush. And then when they hear the first ring, well, they know that the other person is still breathing and smiling. So they told themselves, he is breathing, why not me? So we practice breathing at the same time. And we have the chance to do that three times, at least. And please imagine that uh, two persons on the two ends of the line, breathing and smiling. That is beautiful. And. Um, you cannot have, uh, you cannot uh, resist have uh, a good conversation in that uh, instance. In Plum Village, where I live, we practice uh, telephone meditation very, very well. Uh, every time the phone rings, everyone stay there and breathe. They enjoy it so much that nobody wants to come to the phone. <laughs> so if you have, uh, you. You want to make a phone call to Plum Village, remember, mm-hmm. and, and be patient, and breathe. <laughs> breathe until someone comes to the phone and, and answer you. Mm-hmm. 
Years ago, a person in America told me that uh, he um, he practiced breathing between phone calls because uh, sometimes he had to make ten or more phone calls in a row, and he said that uh, it helps very much. Uh, on telephone call, uh, words can travel thousands of miles. They are to build up more understanding and uh, mutual acceptance. I vow that words of mine will be like gems. I vow that words of mine will be like uh, embroideries. 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 Mỗi lời là châu ngọc, mỗi lời là gấm theo. <laughs> By the way, I have also uh, that gata for diving. You like to know? Uh, before I start the car, I know where I go. That's, that's two lines. Before I start the car, I know where I go. If the car goes fast, I go fast. That's the yajata. It's simple, but it, uh, this is what uh, it means. Many times, we don't really need the car, but we still take it and use it. And that is very bad for our environment. We usually take our car in order to flee from from ourselves, to go somewhere to escape our, our loneliness, our being alone. We cannot bear it, and therefore it contributes to the destruction of our environment. Therefore, uh, so when you are about to start the car, you say, before I start the car, I know where I go. If uh, I'm mindful that this is not really important, and then I shall not use the car. I put the key in my pocket, and I go for a walking meditation. And this is the best. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to to my own destruction, the destruction of my own uh, environment. Because uh, a lot of forest land has been destroyed during the past five years because of, acid, of the acid rain. And uh, therefore, the Gata is to remind me of uh, the danger of using too much my car. If uh, the car goes fast, I go fast. We usually think of, our, of us as uh, the master and the car only as an instrument. Uh, we have a sovereignty over the instruments, but that is not the case in many uh, instances. We know that um, with a gun, a person becomes much more dangerous. But a person who came and uh, shot the children in Stockton, he, 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 he was a person, but with a gun, with uh, an instrument. A person, uh, a, an artist with uh, a musical instrument become much more powerful also. And uh, we know that mankind has become very dangerous because they possess uh, nuclear weapons. They can destroy life on Earth. And uh, we are not sure at all that uh, humans can control the situation now. 
we are very much subjected to fear, and therefore we, we, we may just destroy our uh, ourselves just because of fear. So if the car goes fast, I go fast to my destruction. The instrument. You know that uh, that story, the Zen story about uh, someone uh, riding on a horse and who cannot control the horse. And when someone on the side walk, uh, yelling at him, asking him where he's going, he said, I don't know, you ask the horse. <laughs> uh, it's funny, but it is our situation now. Because we have produced enough to destroy ten times our 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 earth, but we still continue to to make more. So it's not funny. It's the it's the real situation. And when you drive, and if you uh, arrive at a cross section that has uh, well red light. You might get irritated because the red light is uh, an enemy that prevents you to go very quickly to the place you want to arrive. And uh, if you know how to uh, look at the red light and breathe, the, the red light becomes a bell of uh, mindfulness. And then uh, if you practice, you look at the red light as a friend as a Buddha, as a teacher, who reminds you that, well, you don't have to go there to be alive. You are alive right now, and you relax. You breathe in and breathe out, calmly and smiling. And you transform an irritating moment into a peaceful moment. Because the... Uh, the destination sometimes is very boring, much more boring than the present moment. <laughs> and we know what is our final destination. Death, the graveyard, the cremation site. And therefore, we should not uh, hurry to go there. Uh, we, don't, we do not want to go into the direction of, uh, of death. We want to go to where life is. And where life is, is the present moment. So it's uh, the very, very moment when you drive. So drive peacefully, drive happily. And that is why practicing walking meditation makes you more able to drive. Because when you practice stepping on the beautiful earth like that, you learn to go back to every every moment, to the present moment. Every step brings you back to the present moment. And that is why walking like that is not really walking. It's not really for arriving. Walking is like that. It's stopping. Stopping to be alive in the present moment. And therefore, walking meditation is one of the most uh, effective uh, way of practice. And uh, if uh, during the day you have uh, moments of uh, five or ten minutes, you might like to practice walking meditation. Going from one building to another, you practice walking meditation. And slow walking will uh, transform you. Will you will help you to look at, at things in a different way. And that is why uh, yesterday I urged that uh, you practice only walking meditation here, going to the toilet, going to the bathroom, to the kitchen, to your tent. Always walking meditation, nothing else. Because uh, if there is no walking meditation, life is lost in this moment. 
in this moment. For many of us, uh, there is no doubt that the correct practice uh, will bring us joy and healing. And uh, we do not have uh, to wait for a long time to see the effect of the practice. Correct practice can bring you joy and peace, although at the modest level, right after the first hour of practice. There are people who uh, come to Plum Village uh, to practice for one year. There are those who practice for a longer time. There are people who do not have any problem at all, but who come for, for practicing. And uh, I have been in retreats where people um, are practicing joyously. They don't have problems, but they practice in order not to have problems and to be more joyful in their, in their daily life. In Plum Village where I live, uh, many families come uh, during uh, the season of uh, summer to practice. Uh, most of them are refugees. More than three-fourths of them are refugees. Only one-fourth are non-Vietnamese practitioners. And uh, you know the refugees, they have uh, wounds within themselves. They have left everything. They have uh, suffered and death. Uh, many sort of, of uh, casualties within their family. But when they come to the Plum, uh, to Plum Village, they come uh, as family. And if you come and visit us during summer, you see that they are very joyful. Everything they do in the day is joyful. Sitting, walking, ch uh, singing, chanting, <clears throat> tea meditation, everything you make it uh, joyful and they practice joyfully. That does not mean that they don't have the seed of suffering in themselves. But because they practice like that, they reduce the suffering that are in themselves. So Betsy was very correct right when she said last night that uh, we can be joyful with the presence of our pain in ourselves. That's true with the Vietnamese refugees. Uh, It's true that every time uh, we stop popping, we hear the birds and the wind <laughs> thanks to the bell. The non Vietnamese who, who come there, um, there are those who do not have uh, problems, big problems, but there are those who, who do have problems. But if in a, in a community uh, there are many who, who have a balance, within themselves, and he, who can show joy and share joy with other people, that is a healthy community, a, a community where people can profit the most. But if the community has only most of them, most of the people who practice there are having big pains in themselves, so that is uh, difficult. Uh, it, it looks more like a hospital than a practice center. And uh, the best thing is to have uh, um, the majority who practice to increase their joy and their happiness, and just a very small minority to come for healing the big uh, pain within themselves. So this is true with her retreat. There are many retreats where uh, uh, people are more joyful, like the one we just had uh, in Santa Barbara. <laughs> that is a retreat for children. And uh, 
uh, I enjoy it very much. It is exactly like uh, in uh, medicine. Um, there is uh, the practice to to prevent to prevent uh, pain and suffering to arise, and there is a practice to heal the pain the suffering that is already existing. And uh, it is clear that when uh, you have uh, some balance in yourself and that you are not uh, so much uh, dominated by your pain, the practice would be much easier. That is why I always say that don't wait until the situation gets uh, bad in order to begin the practice. Practice right away when you do not have uh, many problems. The practice of uh, massage is of the same. You don't have problems, but if you practice uh, massage to help uh, your blood to circulate well, and then you will prevent uh, many diseases that can happen to you. So this is the same thing. The practice of, of walking, of mind, of uh, thinking, see, the practice of uh, relaxation, of uh, being in touch with the wonders of life is very important. And um, I tell you an example. One day we lost a friend in Bloomfield. Uh, his name is uh, Monsieur Mounier. He's a, he's a very wonderful person. He's one of the uh, Frenchmen, uh, one of the person that I consider to be um, one of the, of the best friends we have in France. He brings us a lot of joy. He taught us how to cultivate the land in the, in the area. Uh, every time he appears, well, we find joy and confidence. And um, he's busy, but he always takes uh, five minutes to come and have a cup of tea with us. And spending five minutes with him is a joy, a real joy. And one day we learned that he had uh, he died because of uh, a heart attack. And that gave all of us uh, a shock. Now, all of us, all of us uh, had already realized that he is uh, a precious uh, gift to us. But all of us regretted that he did not mm, profit the maximum from him. You know, that is um, our common feeling when we lose a friend or uh, someone that is dear to us. And that day we came together and uh, discussed how to help his family. And then we uh, sent that the heart should try for him. And we all sit down and think and speak of him as a gift. And then the, I said that, well, we usually do not cherish what we have enough in the present moment. We wait until we lose them in order to cry, to suffer. So we should learn a very hard lesson about the loss of our friend. And that afternoon, many uh, permanent residents in Plum Village asked the permission to go back and see their father, their mother, their family. I understood, so I urged them to go some 
went to Holland, some went to Switzerland, and so on. That night, I I could not sleep. It was painful to lose a friend like that. So the pain uh, was uh, gripping at my heart. And I could not sleep. I said that I I have to sleep because uh, I have things to do tomorrow. <laughs> So the way I I did it is to uh, invite the three shadows that I planned had planted ten years uh, ago in my garden to come with me, and I contemplate these shadows, shadows, and I breathe uh, on them. Now they are very high and already it's a species called uh, Cedrus uh, deodara in Latin. And uh, during my walking meditation, I used to stop and come and hug them with a lot of uh, uh, awareness. Hugging a tree, looking up at the green, and this in this up uh, mindfully. And to me, they responded to my hugging and breathing. I feel always happy hugging these three uh, cedars. If you have not tried, and then please try. And then uh, after that, I invited uh, little, the little bamboo to come. Little bamboo, he, her name is Betuk. She was only six, five. She's uh, a very cute uh, little girl who come to Plum Village very often. She was born in Bordeaux, and uh, she has two. Uh, she master Vietnamese and and French. When she come to Plum Village, she only speak Vietnamese, and she behave exactly like a Vietnamese little girl. And uh, I did not know that she has another capacity of being with the French children. So one day, the several uh, French children came, and she she found herself very at ease, like uh, a fish in the water. She played with them, she talked French, and she behaved it exactly like a French girl. <laughs> and uh, she came. She began to come. She began a plum villagers at the age of. Uh, Two and a half, and she's so cute that uh, the older children uh, all want to to hold her. So she did not have much uh, occasion to walk um, <laughs> on the soil of the village. <laughs> and um, so I invited her back to my consciousness. I was breathing, smiling with the image of uh, little bamboo when I fell. Uh, I felt asleep. So the practice that night night is to use an image that uh, is refreshing, that is healing, in order to counterbalance the image of death and you know, suffering. And I dwell firmly on this new image, and I practice breathing and smiling on it. And the result is that I could uh, sleep during that night. And that is uh, what uh, everyone uh, can do. Uh, if you live mindfully, and if you could get in touch with uh, the wonderful things in our daily life, like that tree, or that little girl, or many other things. And then you have uh, a kind of uh, reserve within ourselves for the sake of uh, difficult moments. And therefore, the practice in order to be in touch with life in each moment is very important.
they counterbalance the suffering uh, which is in us. The sky, the moon, the stars, the trees, the ocean, the snow, they belong to all of us, and we have uh, equal opportunity to enjoy them. But there are those who, who have more sense, because uh, they have the capacity of getting in touch. And it needs a little bit of practice in order to not to overlook. <laughs>